Welcome everyone and thank you for joining us for Swivel's Adaptability Initiative webinar series. This is our ongoing series where we are supporting educators as, as we adapt to the, the world of AI. I'm, I'm Gerard Dawson. I'm the product manager for Reflectivity at Swivel. And uh, you know, at Swivel, we're, we're dedicated to helping educators adapt through, through this series and through um, some of our tools like Reflectivity, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Uh, but, but for now, I'd like to introduce you to today's uh, speaker, Holly Clark. Uh, Holly Clark is a passionate educator and digital learning pioneer who has made significant contributions to the field of education technology. Holly is an international speaker and a best-selling author, uh, most recently of her title, The AI-Infused Classroom. She was one of the first teachers to have a one-to-one -one classroom in, in 1999 through 2000 uh, school year. That's such a cool fact. She <laughs> has dedicated her career to equipping educators globally with blended learning strategies. She is a Google certified innovator, a Microsoft innovative educator expert, and a national board certified teacher. Uh, Holly's insightful work has made her a trusted authority for those keen to upgrade their teaching techniques through technology. And we're so excited to, to hear, Holly, what you have to share tonight. So over to you. Okay, so thank you. And I'm going to share my screen. And hopefully, if I'm saying something and it's not on the screen, let me know. Um, that happens to me sometimes. And I want to apologize to everyone in here that sometimes I'm going to be looking over at the screen because I'm doing a double screen thing here. I'm, I was just saying I need that big, large screen. I've got to get that because this looking over at the other screen is kind of a leftover from the pandemic. Um, so tonight we're going to reflect on uh, one year of us having basically AI, generative AI, but really in the form of bots. And we're talking about ChatGPT, and we'll talk mostly about ChatGPT just because that is our first introduction generally to this generative AI. So I'm going to head over here. Give me one second. I just got to get this to move on my other screen. And um, and if you are uh, looking for any of the things that I'll share tonight, I won't be sharing this particular slide deck, but like the book and information on even speaking or some resources about AI, you can just head to infuse.link forward slash info, and that will take you to my link tree, which has some of the links to this. Also, I'm going to be sharing a graphic by someone. So uh, Alex, who is in, in this particular event, and um, we're going to give you his Twitter information as well. And we're going to do that in the chat. So keep an eye on the chat for things like that. So as most of you know that are here, in, in November 30th of this of last year, we were introduced to ChatGPT. And many people learned about it through a friend or on Twitter or, or uh, TikTok. But really, ChatGPT or OpenAI, who creates ChatGPT, only put out really a pretty flimsy blog post that said, hey, we have this thing if anyone wants to look at it. And a few people looked at it and started playing with it and were like sharing all over social media. So from this very kind of like basic blog post came this frenzy that happened. And so we're going to look at what, what has happened with ChatGPT and also the pretty epic battle that has happened in schools around now having this new AI. Some people saying they don't want to ever have it in their classrooms and some people saying, let's bring this in and see how we can use it. So the really interesting fact is that within the first five days, ChatGPT had a million users. So that social media impact went big, went furious and strong. And within about six to eight weeks, uh, you saw a million users using ChatGPT, uh, the highest number of any app ever. And um, it, in comparison, TikTok, it took them nine months to get a million users. And it took Instagram 2.5 years. And those are the ones that come directly after it, the amount of time it took to get a million users. So this was a phenomenon. And a lot of people were taking notice of this kind of new thing that came out. And if you think about it and you think back to when you first went on and used it, if you are one of those users, it was solely text-based. It had a lot of really prolific and absurd biases. In fact, someone asked it 
back when it first came out, who won the 2016 election. It went out to its data and saw that you win an election by a popular vote. So it came back and said, well, Hillary Clinton won the 2016 election. And we were getting answers like that early on. It still has a tremendous amount of bias and coded bias in it. In fact, Ken Shelton gave a session for Swivel last night. And when you get an email with uh, this particular session, you're going to get in that email his session. I highly recommend you watch what he says about bias because um, there's some really great information in there. Um, in that early version, the data set, so the data that was used to train ChatGPT went up until September 2021. We're now at a version, if you have ChatGPT Plus, that goes up to April 2023. But if you're still using the free version of ChatGPT, that is trained on data to uh, January 2022. And that's significant. That amount of year from January 2022 to April 2023 is a significant amount of data, making the ChatGPT Plus version quite smarter than the free version. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the differences between the plus and the free version and a little bit about something called PO, which is um, an alternative if you're in another country or you want access to other bots. Um, and we saw the first update happen, and that was ChatGPT 4.0, and it came out quickly after, about four months after on March 13th. And that began this thing where you could buy the plus version. So you could keep with ChatGPT 3.5, which so many people are still using that. Or you could have the plus version, which gave you access to ChatGPT 4. But then we saw, and I'm going to come back to this in one second. Then we saw Microsoft get involved in this right about this time. And they made a $10 billion, that's with a B, uh, cash infusion in OpenAI. And at that time, they got access to ChatGPT 4 in, in simple terms. And they put ChatGPT 4 into Microsoft Bing. And... Um, Microsoft Bing uh, has access for free if you just sign up with your email account to ChatGPT4 and now Dolly 3. So that becomes a way that teachers, if we're looking at education, have been able to maneuver around having to pay for it. But I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to head back over here and we're going to look at this kind of new AI. And I like to say a lot of people when ChatGPT came out, they would be in schools and they would be discussing AI and they would be like, oh, we've been using that forever. Like we have spell check, we have Grammarly, we have whatever. And that is actually a machine learning, a predictive AI. And I like to just kid around and say, that's your grandfather's AI. <laughs> like this AI of deep learning is a whole different ball of wax. It is. It learns on its own. We don't know how it makes its decisions. It is constantly learning. Right now, it's learning as we speak. Where the Grammarly is not learning. It's been it's been programmed by an algorithm to make predictive things about sentences or your spelling. And these are two different versions of AI. Deep learning falls and generative AI, which are the basically the same thing, falls into the the umbrella of machine learning. But this is not your grandfather's AI. And that's really important to understand because we're going to see such changes with this because we're in a quantum computing age that this is going to be something completely different. And that's why schools need to be kind of on guard with this. And I mean on guard is in terms of like bringing it in and doing it effectively and not putting their heads in the sand. So another early competitor was BARD. And most people are not very impressed with BARD. Um, Google knows that, so they've just released Gemini, and Gemini is supposed to be quite powerful, but all of the stuff that I'm reading, and I, I read way too much about AI, is saying that some of the data that they're releasing and saying that Gemini does actually is a little sketchy, and it might not do all of those things, but it for sure is a competitor of ChatGBT, just might not be better, like they're kind of um, saying that it is. They even have found that they said showed this uh, video of it using a drawing about the duck and that that particular video was actually like edited and shot and photoshopped kind of to use that term. So so I'm I'm have one eyebrow up about Gemini, but I'm also really excited if we can up the game and keep upping the game. And then there was Anthropic, and Anthropic was started by siblings who were working at OpenAI and thought this is going to be kind of a scary situation. We want to make sure that we produce OpenAI that is not biased, that isn't producing all of these um, kind of 
answers that are a little bit questionable. So that became an early competitor. Not a lot of people have used Anthropic. It's actually one of my favorite because of the results that it produces. But um, these come into the market about probably we start seeing them kind of bigger around March through May of um, 2023. So what do we need to know, though, about AI? What have we learned from people who have written stuff about it? So we know this from people like Mogadot. Um, who was worked at Google X Lab, um, I believe. And he said that there, uh, and he and uh, many other people, this is continuous throughout the literature on AI, that AI will have a consciousness, it will have emotions, it will have ethics, and it will have values. And that's just a matter of time. And as we delve more after a year, that amount of time is becoming shorter and shorter. And a lot of people are like tightening the window on that. I used to hear like, oh, it's going to be 35 years. Then I heard it's like 10. And recently I've heard it's like three. I don't know. I'm not the person who's going to make those kinds of decisions. But recently you saw the ousting of Sam Altman out of um, OpenAI. He's back in, as we know. But that was over. Who is going to uh, keep AI safe? And who is going to say when that AI has gotten to this place where it has all of these things that are called AGI, which it means artificial general intelligence, which means it's doing things that humans can do. Um, people in the AI sphere uh, and people who write the book say that it's most probable that by the time a kindergartner graduates from high school, that the AI could be up to a billion times smarter than a human. So we're getting kids ready for this thing that's going to look completely different. Even within the next year, we're going to see a completely different workflow for people in, in work. And we're going to talk about that. And in the next two to five years, but the more I'm reading, I'm going to have to like make this more like one to two years. Um, I would predict probably two, two to three, I'll give it that. Um, we'll assume that all writing has been touched by AI. And actually, I'm going to go back to one to two. So what does that mean for the writing process? And that's why we get a lot of language arts teachers who are like, I'm not letting kids use this. What about authentic work? What about whatever? And we're going to talk a little bit about this. But what, what this did is it created this kind of angst in schools. Like, how do we deal with this? And the angst has to be founded in when people are having these discussions, we have to understand that the World Economic uh, Forum says that in by 2025, so basically for us, because we're in December, that's a year from now, um, we will see job loss of 83 million jobs worldwide, I guess, but probably more because that's not, that's a 85 million jobs. And I honestly don't know if they were talking about the US or, or worldwide but that we'll see the creation of 97 million new jobs for those students who know how to work with AI. So we have to think about that because whether or not we're teaching history or language arts, we might really love our subject, but the truth is we're getting kids ready for a job market so that they can someday buy a house, that they can make money, that they can be love what they do. And if we're thinking about their job market, then we have to prepare them for this AI revolution. And that means letting them use AI in classrooms when age appropriate. So it started this kind of thing back in around March or April. Teachers started seeing this open AI and everyone was talking about it, the chat GBT version. And, um, and many teachers were like, whoa, this could really be great. This is fantastic. And there was this excitement. But at the same time, we saw other teachers being like, oh, students are going to use this to cheat. And, and I call this the beginning of the epic battle, the epic battle between what are we going to do here between no, we're teaching students how to learn and no, we're teaching students information and they're going to use that information. I don't know, like for what. So there's always been this sort of epic battle, I believe, in education, but now it becomes like time sensitive, pretty much. Um, when we have statistics like the ones that I'm showing you, can we wait and adjust? So there's a lot of people on one side you saying, no, we need to take it slow for sure, but we need to um, teach students what this AI is and how we might use it safely to collaborate and learn. While other people are like, nope, I'm banning the use of this in my classrooms. Kids are never going to use it. I'm going to use AI detectors. I'm going to make sure that they're turning in papers uh, that aren't they couldn't cheat on 
And, and a lot of teachers are just saying, I'm just going to ignore this until admin does something about it or reverse. Some teachers like, is admin ever going to say anything about it? Um, and so we're in this place where education, which moves slowly in terms of innovation, is not knowing how to how to react to this. Some schools are getting training and that's great, but um, some schools aren't and, and I don't know how they're addressing it. So all of these big changes start rolling out once we get ChatGPT. Some of the first ones are we get a mobile version and that happens in about March. So you can use it on your phone. Then we get some custom instructions. First, it's only for the ChatGPT plus users, but then all of a sudden um, 3.5 users can use these custom instructions, which you can tell it like I'm a social studies teacher. I want you to respond in tables from now on, whatever. Um, and then they decide, that everything they roll out is going to be for the plus version pretty much. So that that $20 a month uh, that you pay for ChatGPT, you're going to get these things. You're going to get vision, which allows you to interpret graphs and data and all and um, stuff using your camera. You're going to get code interpreter, which has changed my life. I don't know how people live without ChatGPT for, for this reason alone. I can take a CSV file, put it into ChatGPT, into the prompt, and I can have a conversation with the data. I can ask, like, what are the five most important things I need to know from this data? Where, where am I seeing particular problems? Where are their strengths? And so what I'm able to do is exactly what I just said, have a conversation with data. And I think this is one of the biggest things for teachers that we need to understand is that we now have this ability to talk to data. And I think that's going to allow us to be better at our job. We also had the integration of Dolly 3, which is major and awesome. Uh, into this plus version. We have the integration of Microsoft Bing for plus users so that if I ask a question that has an answer that might be within the internet, Bing will automatically go search the internet. This is happening in the plus edition. And then we just saw um, when they had their dev day, I think October, November 6th, I don't know which, I've been traveling too much. But um, we saw the the advent of custom GPTs, which are bots. And I'm going to talk about bots because I think for 2024 in the education realm, bots are going to be one of the biggest things that uh, teachers begin to do. And you'll see, I'll talk about like kind of like my predictions for education, but bots is definitely one of them. And some people don't even know what those are. And um, so I'm going to show you an example. And then now that for the plus users, we are going to, uh, we are going to be, um, uh, or the plus users have data trained up until April, 2023, which increases the IQ. So they give, they've given the chat GPT an IQ test and it went from something around the early 200s to into the mid 300s once that extra data set was in there and it started learning. So you're dealing with a considerably different chat GPT with the plus version. If you're a person who's like, no, I'm just using the three, five, Point five, it's good enough. I can tell you the data interpreter alone has changed my life. <laughs> I can't, I'm just not a spreadsheet person. You can't show me a spreadsheet and I gather and I look at it and compile things. It's just not who I am, but I can have a conversation with data now. And so that is who I am. And that's how I find stuff out. And, um, uh, um, and Alex just shared a story in the, in the chat as well. I mean, it's game changing. I just, I, I, can't recommend it enough. So people started uh, talking about AI and how we would use it in UNESCO. And I don't feel like American schools talk about UNESCO enough, but UNESCO is U the UN's education kind of wing. And they started to produce some really important kind of ideas around how we should be dealing with this AI. It's probably, and and this one, I there's a link and um, I'm going to have, I, I gave it to uh, to you guys earlier, if you can put it in, but this this will take you to the UNESCO data. By the way, you can take this in a PDF, put it if you have the plus version, put it into PD uh, into ChatGPT, and start to have a conversation about what's in this PDF too. So like, it's crazy because it's 168 pages. But they started to come out with some ideas of what some of those literacies are we need in schools. And if you are a leader or you are on some AI kind of team at your school. I think this UNESCO document is one of the most important that you can read. In this case, uh, if you are an AI leader at your school, you need to read this entire document. And one of the things that it talks about that I find so interesting is it talks about that students need to become bilingual now in this like 
in this new AI revolution, being able to talk to bots, being able to prompt, being able to do whatever. The, the literature is leaning towards prompt engineering as we know it won't be quite as important as we think because most of this AI is built on natural language processing where we can have a conversation with the AI. So I would just keep that um, in your thought process that it's possible that prompt engineering as we know it might kind of fall to the wayside. Um, I can't predict that, but that's just that's just what I'm hearing and kind of what I'm seeing when I go down rabbit holes. I'll, I'll do a big prompt, like act as a award-winning teacher and give me a lesson plan for whatever. And then I'll just ask, can you make me a lesson plan for that same thing? And they're not distinctly different. So that's, and I've done that like for hours at a time and I just didn't find a big enough difference. So that's when I started doing research on, on prompt engineering and whether or not that's going to be a thing. So something just to keep your, um, uh, keep your eye on. So what enters in this little new debate between teachers and they're cheating and no, we need to use it is this thing called AI detectors. And if you're in a Google school, you'll have, um, when a kid turns in a paper, it has to go through an AI detector. And there are some problems with AI detectors that people need to be aware of. I personally think it's a problematic answer to a much bigger issue. And some of the things that are problematic with AI detectors is they have high uh, false positives. They'll say it's 40% written by AI when it's not. And then we have a bunch of kids who are just trying to rewrite things so that they can it can pass this AI detector test. And that's not, I don't think that's what we should be looking for in education. It has false positives for higher false positives for people who are non-native English speakers, which is completely uh, um, an unequal stance on this. Um, it promotes this assumption that using AI is bad. I think in the future, we're all going to use AI all of the time. So I think we need to get our wrap our heads around this sooner than later, because this is a big deal. Now, ChatGPT has age restrictions. If you're under 13, you can't use it, but you could use your teachers with your teachers sitting there, possibly. That's got to be something for you to think about at your school. Or... Um, or if you're above 13, you can get parent permission. And ISTE has on their AI website, has a very good parent permission letter that you can just download and use. And so, um, and in cases where a kid might be like in seventh grade, but young for the age, I, I, you know, you have to talk to your administration about that. Um, but what we should be considering instead is teaching kids to use it, to cite it, how to correctly cite it, but beyond citing it, how to talk about that collaborative process. And um, I was talking about this. I was in Hong Kong recently and I was um, doing a session and there were a lot of really great educators in that session. And we started to have this conversation about what should kids be doing when they use AI. And so Alex, who is in this particular, and I put his Twitter um, handle, if you guys can show that. Oh, let me go here. Um, who is in this session. He went back to his school, the American uh, or the um, Shanghai American School and kind of put this really into an idea, a graphic, something that they show at their school. And I just want to give a shout out, like a lot of people don't understand international schools are not where people are over teaching English. These are top, top schools, like top of the line. I always say like an American private school, this is like two steps above. These people uh, in, in, in international schools are able to do such incredible things because they have the funding they have the permission. So he went back to his school and he made this kind of graphic that he has going throughout Shanghai American School for kids to think about when they're using AI. And it and it's based around, and he used this kind of like um, mnemonic tape, like be transparent about, be open and honest about when and how generative AI informed your work using citations, appendices, screenshots, stuff like that. And by the way, if you go to Alex's Twitter, he has this pinned to his account so you can get this image. Um, make sure, carefully examine and make sure the information is accurate. Um, document your thinking process when you're working on this. So citing it's not enough. And this is where I have a lot of problem with the way people are approaching this. Citing something, we need to understand your collaborative thought process. What happened when you asked ChatGPT to give you an answer? What did you do next? What did that produce? I want to know more than just you citing it. And so this is kind of um, 
how they're dealing with it there. And I'll soon be dealing with it at my school. Um, and then what are the expectations? Like follow your teacher's expectations. Different teachers are going to have different expectations around this. What if you're in an IB school or you're an AP curriculum? What are the expectations there? So um, this is a really good way to get students thinking about when they use generative AI, because that's the step that's not happening that we need to have happening in schools. And most, um, as of December, as of this month, this is what I'm seeing the most. I'm seeing that the current policy in most schools is that um, we wanna keep with academic integrity and we want to cite AI. But I, um, I think that falls a little short personally in that we need to have students learn to talk about this collaborative process. So those are some of the things that we've used. And here's how students are saying that they've used it. They're using it themselves at home to ask it for like a second grader explanation for uh, maybe something in organic chemistry. So explain this to a second grader and they're understanding the concepts at a more deep level when they get a, a like their textbook does it in 11th grade level, they want it in a second grade level. They're also asking it to iterate ideas and those nuances are helping them understand things a lot deeper. They're getting writing feedback. And this one kid in this uh, example says, I don't feel like I'm bothering the teacher. Like I always felt like I was bothering the teacher and now I don't feel like that. And when the AI tells me I did something wrong, it doesn't hurt as much kind of thing. Like it just doesn't have that same kind of Thing maybe. And um, and asking AI for multiple pers perspectives, maybe con uh, arguments of things. But here's what this one student said. He said, I wish my teachers knew this, that AI isn't thinking for me. It's actually making me a better thinker. And I think in schools, we think kids aren't going to have authentic thought. I think kids are not going to have authentic voice in something. They didn't write that. They didn't come up with that. I think that's a very limited perspective of what working with AI can do. And the more you work with AI, the more you will see that this is not a thing where it's replacing your intelligence. It's probably augmenting your intelligence a little bit. So here's how I've seen schools getting ready. And I kind of made a synopsis of it. A lot is happening with targeted PD. You can't, teachers need help here. Um, by providing resources and a repository of particular AI tools, I'm going to talk about this quickly in a second, giving the teachers best practice ideas, best practice examples, creating communities of thought and leadership around this, getting ethical guidelines. What do we consider ethical? What do we think is ethically wrong inside um, the chat GBT answers? And again, go to Ken's session for that. And then teaching them how to design using AI. Like we know how to design a lesson plan, but now how am I going to do it inside of AI? And people are coming up with apps to help with that. But I really think that um, they're just coming up with bots. And, and so I think you can get better questions if you learn to do it in ChatGBT yourself. So here's how I'm handling it. And Alex is actually handling quite the same at Shanghai American School. In fact, we're going to have a partnership between the school district and Darien, um, Connecticut and Shanghai to really keep with best practices. But we know in change management that if you give teachers all these AI tools, they're going to feel overwhelmed and they're going to be like, I just can't right now. I don't have time. So keeping it to like a few tools. And I've chosen with the teachers that I work with, ChatGPT. Um, Alex can't because in, in Shanghai, they, they need Po because uh, you don't have access to ChatGPT in China. Um, uh, Canva, which is where I'm teaching kids about AI image generation. But when that AI image generation is not great, going to Microsoft Bing, which has free access for Dolly, but not all my kids can get onto Microsoft Bing. And so I have to think about those issues and making sure that you have those issues covered in your AI policy is really important. And then I'm a huge fan of Magic School AI. And Magic School AI is really just a bunch of different bots that are trained to give you certain things. And so that bot mentality is going to be, um, is going to be, big for 2024. Some other important tools just to know about, but I wouldn't overwhelm. But when teachers are ready, I Poe, which is a curator of a bunch of different bots. I really do love Poe. Um, I don't have to use it here in the US, but it's something to look at. Adobe Firefly is probably going to replace one of my other four. I am a big fan of Adobe Firefly right now. Curapod, EduAid, Perplexity, which does research, of course, Anthropic, which does research, and then Character AI is just darn fun for kids. They get to talk to a character. Like you can put in 
Pony Boy in The Outsiders and have a conversation with Pony Boy. And it does quite a good job. But as I end, I want to tell you that these are what um, industry experts are saying about what ChatGPT will produce. And it's and this guy, Jeremiah Oyang, Oyang, I don't know how to say his name, but he says, by the end of 2024, our digital lives will be transformed, starting with our daily communication. So we're going to writing here again. Every individual at home or work will have an AI agent to manage their emails. Uh, initially, it will filter, highlight, and summarize messages. As the agent analyzes our history, understands context, and incorporates our feedback, we will, over time, trust it to respond on our behalf using a defined set of guidelines and rules. And he's saying that this will happen by the end of 2024. I'm all in because I'd rather have someone else answer my email. But that's the kind of stuff um, we're going to see. And this other person said that generative AI will affect employee expectations for the technology they use at work, becoming table stakes for talent retention. So I want you to think about this in education. Teachers need access to AI tools. We cannot make them pay for them on their own. We've got to start substituting out some other tools. We've got to maybe take out some of those video platforms or whatever, and we've got to bring in AI tools. We just can't keep going without them. Um, I recommend to schools that they even provide ChatGPT plus to teachers. Um, if we don't provide employees with generative AI solutions, I feel like it's asking them to use a typewriter when word processors are available. And we need to think about that. So things like magic school, things like getting them ChatGPT um, at, at the school is going to be something that's going to be a discussion point, especially for those of us who don't have teachers anymore and are trying to get teachers or retain them and say, well, you're going to get a ChatGPT Plus account. I mean, it could be something. So what do I think is going to happen in the future? I think teachers creating bots. I think there's going to be wonderment stations. This is something we're trying at a school I work with, where in the schools or the classrooms where kids are under 13, there's a wonderment station and it is signed into ChatGPT by the teacher. And when a kid has a question, they can go over to that station and ask a question of ChatGPT. That way it's not gathering the student's data. And we know what they ask because we have a record of it. But they have an opportunity to say, what could be like a con argument to Christopher Columbus? Or uh, I'm having problem with this sentence. Could you give me a couple other examples? And the great thing about the Wonderment Station is that it gives other examples to the sentences, but the students can't copy and paste it because it's not their computer. So they have to write it down or they have to analyze or just go back. And so there, there's not that opportunity for let's call it straight cheating, um, which I don't like that term. And I think AI image generation is going to be a big way students uh, show their work coming up. And it's also a crowd pleaser with teachers. Um, we're going to have to have extensive AI training for teachers with, um, with really, for me, based around lesson design and access to these AI tools. And um, I want to show you really quick a bot. Speaking of Taylor Swift, and it's her birthday today, and she, the Ares tour is coming out. This is an example of a bot if you haven't seen one before. So I'm teaching students about writing using Taylor Swift lyrics. So I created a bot that they can go to and only answers because I have I have created it with parameters and guardrails that say you can only answer using Taylor Swift uh, lyrics and, and something Taylor Swift would say. So it's trained on ChatGPT for me. It's trained on ChatGPT4. And when a student goes in, it first, it'll say, hey, Swifty, how can I help you? And they might say something like, um, "What? why did you write the song Mean? And it will only answer, and I didn't put this song, but it will know because it's AI. Um, and it'll only answer about Taylor Swift lyrics. And I think those bots that are specific to certain subject areas that we're teaching in class are going to become very prolific. And um Right now, it's over some teachers' heads, but I think by mid-2024, I think most teachers are going to be interested in being able to buy them or get them or make them. Um, I think it's going to become a very important part of uh, schools. So here's one now, the custom GPTs in GPT+. I have one that's a creative writing coach that they've made. I could make one for my own kids with certain parameters, but they can ask it to give it feedback. I'm stuck um, with my character development. Can you help me? And so there are things that this custom GPT will do, but it will only answer around writing. 
It won't go into something else. And that kind of helps us limit some of the bias that could happen, some of the things that we're afraid of kids doing. Now, students who are under 13 can't do this. And so this is where those wonderment stations could become a good part of the day and, and having that open. But that has to be something you discuss with your admin that can't work for every other person or every school. Everyone's going to be different. So the recap, and then I'll answer questions, um, is this. Um, we know that ChatGPT has emerged as the AI tool. Microsoft Bing has come in as a second, close second, I'm trying to say. But ChatGPT by far is the um, is the tool. Um, we need we have to provide educators with training. We can't forget about that. Uh, and honestly, admin needed it too. Um, and we have to allow them to understand AI so they'll understand the revolution it's going to have in our classrooms. And we need to uh, have AI policies that understand that we can't block it. Citing's not enough. Like we have to go a little deeper than this. We're smarter than this. Citing is not enough. It's never been enough. We're, and so it's good. It's a good first step. But we have to have kids critically thinking about this collaboration process. So anyway, that's my recap. I'm going to turn this off and stop sharing because I, I'm. there could be some questions because I heard that. Um, or I think I saw that. Uh, yeah, maybe thank not. you, Molly. So uh -huh. if a couple, we recapped a couple of the questions in the, in the chat. One was about... Um, safety and, and student data, ask, asking about um, basically how can admin and, and IT folks think about uh, protecting student data when it comes to the use of AI tools? I know a broad topic, but I'm wondering if you can share your, your thoughts on that. Well, there are rules set out by every company. And one of the things, again, with Alex has done is like when they picked their four tools at Shanghai American School, he put on there, this is for 13, this is for whatever. And I think having a document that shares that if those are the tools that you're going to adopt at your school is important. But um, like I said, with these wonderment stations, that was my way of working around the fact that I didn't want student data be collected and um, and. I wanted them to be able to ask ChatGPT a question every once in a while if they got stuck on something. Um, that is a very uh, fuzzy line, to be honest. Like you have to, to, you have to really talk with people about it at your school. But that's the way I'm addressing it because I want kids to understand what we can ask ChatGPT, what we can ask a bot, and what we get back. And I wanted them to just because they're under 13, not be prepared for their job market. We know that, that companies say kids are not ready for the job market. And that's because we have been teaching 1985 skills all through the 20s or 20, 2000, sorry now. Um, and we can't do that here. We just don't have the ability. So um, the data, kids shouldn't be on it if they're under 13. I like how you, how you point out that it is, it can be Fuzzy though, because when you're yeah. when you're adapting just to something that's changing as rapidly as AI, the exact way to proceed may not always be clear, and you may have to yeah. try something out and, and adjust. Mm -hmm. uh, one other uh, sort of question comment uh, mix that I want to share with you is, I believe Caleb was uh, asking when you were talking about assessment. As educators, we all have to ask. How can we shift lessons and ways of thinking to harness AI to improve student learning? And he, he brought up previously that um, maybe an assignment may not be worth doing if it can be done 100% with AI. So that comment is exactly right. Like one of the things that Magic School AI does is it um, has a thing, and I don't remember the name, but it kind of like will let you know is this assignment you're doing, is this, can this be done by a kid in AI at home? And you can kind of get a feel for whether or not the assignment now is just AI worthy, I guess, in a world of AI. And I think what we're going to have to do, and once you learn how to use ChatGBT, you can ask it to help you with this, but we've got to create assignments that aren't just like, oh, tell me about um, identity in the outsiders. And that's your final thing, because that can be done using 
uh, ChatGPT easy. So now we're going to have to shift. And what's really scary to me is this, that Google just um, had its birthday about three months ago, and it's been out for 25 years. And I go to schools where teachers are like, eh, I'm just not that good at technology. And I want to say, was 25 years not enough? Like quarter of a century, like not enough? And when, we, when we're thinking about AI, I feel like this year of AI has been sort of equivalent to those 25 years of Google being out and all the changes that we saw. And so I don't think we have time. We have time to be cautious. We have time to think it through, but I don't think we have time to, to only teach those old essays, to only teach the test. I mean, we have kids have to take the test, so we've got to teach it. But we've got to find these other workarounds that they're doing some other stuff as well. We all have standards. They have standards in Shanghai, but um, but they but we um we have to just be creative right now because it's really important. <laughs> Maybe one one last question here. Brooke is is wondering about AI related news. You mentioned you read a lot about AI yeah. and wants to know if you can recommend sources for those of us who want to stay in the know. So um, first this book, let me see if it won't show because of the thing, <laughs> sorry. Uh -huh. It's called The Coming Wave and um, it's by uh, Mustafa Suleiman. And he is one of the first creators of the deep mind, which was once owned by Google, no longer owned by Google. That is a great book to read. There's also a book called um, Scary Smart by Mo Gadot, And I also have that here, but I won't show, but let's just see if maybe there. Oh, oh yeah. Scary Smart. Um, these are two great reads. Um, if you drive to work, you could get them on audiobooks. Great look at like it's going to be scary and it's going to be really smart. So where the truth lies somewhere in the middle. I also, um, uh, I follow a lot of um, people on TikTok. I'm a TikTok person who are talking about AI. So I have AI um, because I like and I comment on AI videos. TikTok delivers me two things. It delivers me AI and Taylor Swift. And that's the perfect algorithm for me. <laughs> so that's a lot of what I'm doing. Um, uh, is SAS using AI? I don't know if Alex is still here. He, Alex, are you still here? Uh, uh they're using Poe, um, because they, they're a China school and they can't use ChatGPT, but yeah. And so Poe, which I talked about, but they are also, I'm pretty sure Alex, if you can, uh, what about your under 13s? How are you addressing it? And then I'll look at this other one. This this most recent one oh. we, you answered before, speaking about student data privacy. But, um. Um, and um, someone just mentioned the Ditch Summit, which um, is my Matt Miller. We do a podcast together. Um, and yes, he, <laughs> I, I suggested Scary Smart to him and he suggested The Coming Wave to me. So we both talk about these books a lot. Although I had already bought Coming Wave and I didn't know it. I just didn't read it yet. <laughs> um, anyway, and so Alex says our four main platforms, yeah, are Poe, Padlet, Canva, and Magic School. And then um, elementary SAS is using AI with Canva. Canva is a way to do it um, safely. And that's why I really love using Canva that way. Also Padlet too. And Alex, they say you're unmuted if you want to say anything. <laughs> You might not be in the mood. <laughs> okay, that's okay. Um, all right. Well, just, as we can see from from the the ideas Holly has has shared, it, it, a theme of the night is that we need to be adaptable. Uh, and as a as a quick note to close, this is what Swivel is all about as well. We believe that educators can become more adaptable by exploring many ideas uh, and through doing what we call socializing your, your reflection, which means um, sharing what you're learning in a, in a community of people who are exploring similar ideas and, and facing uh, similar challenges. So I wanna 
um, show us just a quick look at how you could um, explore ideas like what Holly shared with us tonight in um, our platform, Reflectivity. Uh, and again, Reflectivity is where you can adapt to challenges and build skills by socializing reflection. So um, here would be a, a zoomed out view of basically all the learning, all the idea exploration that's happening in your organization if you're uh, using reflectivity. So each of these rectangles you see is a, is a skill community. It's a group of teachers who are exploring new ideas uh, and building skills by, by sharing their learning process. So I highlighted one idea from Holly's presentation, this, this concept of kind of exploring a debate or sort of, uh, you know, pros and cons for lack of a better term around ChatGPT. So we can take a look at what it might look like for me to uh, build this skill in, in a community of, of teachers doing the same. So once you zoom into one of the specific skills, again, in this case, exploring debate around ChatGPT, it looks like this. And here I see the, the latest in the learning process of all my colleagues who are working on the same skill as me. Um, so I can see that my, my colleague, Catherine M, for example, recently reflected on, on the last step she's taken in her learning journey, which is to join a community. So, um, you know, you can, you can share with your colleagues when you've tried a new resource, tested out a new strategy, read an article, um, met up to have a conversation and, and really anything else you've done. And by, by learning in this way, by socializing your reflection, uh, it helps educators adapt to fast moving challenges like AI because it's a teacher driven approach where you're you're exchanging ideas about the latest things you've done. You're, you're getting feedback about the most recent steps you've taken. Um, so you can sort of figure out what works faster, um, explore new ideas flexibly and dynamically, and then uh, adjust course if you need to, as opposed to the traditional top-down uh, professional learning process, which is a little bit more rigid long-term and make it a little harder to become adaptable. So this is reflectivity where educators can, can build skills and adapt by socializing their reflection in a, in a community like this. So if you'd, if you'd like to learn a little bit more, uh, you can come visit us at swivel.com slash reflectivity. If you have your mobile device, you can take a moment to open the camera and, and scan that QR code. Uh, and, and that's all. And that's all uh, we'll share about that for tonight. So um, otherwise though, Holly, I wanna, I wanna thank you for joining us for the adaptability series. Um, we, we are continuing tomorrow night with our guest, Steve Dembo. So please join us again tomorrow. And thank you again, Holly. Thank you everyone for joining and we'll and see you next time. And it looks like you have had the CEO of Magic School on your um, on your webinar series. So that's pretty exciting. Looks like you have a lot of really great webinars for people to watch. Right. Yeah, you can. We, we had a deal on. Yeah, we can you can catch him and, and others uh, on our website or on or on YouTube. Thanks very much, everyone. Hope you have a great night.